Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight's story is the strange and unsettling tale of The Princess and the Ragamuffin. This story was written by Benito Perez Galdos, first published in 1877. This version was translated into English by Antoinette Ogden and published in Christmas Stories from French and Spanish Writers in 1892. This is another in this series I'm calling Nightmares Before Christmas, full of weird and obscure stories that take place at the holiday season. I have a whole playlist of these stories, which you can find in the description below. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Part 1 Pacorito Megajas was a great character. He stood a trifle over two feet from the ground and had just turned his seventh year. His skin was tanned by the sun and the wind, and his wizened face suggested a dwarf rather than a child. His eyes, adorned with long eyelashes that looked like black wires, were full of vitality and resplendent with mischief. His mouth was amazing in its ugliness, and his ears, strangely like those of a fawn, seemed to have been attached to his face rather than to have grown there. He was dressed in a shirt of every possible shade of grime, and a pair of patchwork trousers upheld by a single suspender. In the winter he wore a coat which he had inherited from his grandfather. The sleeves had been cut off at the elbow, and Pacorito considered it a handsome fit, as overcoats go. A rag, which aspired to be a muffler, was wound like a snake round and round his neck, and on his head he wore a cap, which he had picked up at the rastro. He had little use for shoes, which he considered in the light of a hindrance. Neither did he wear stockings, having a great aversion to the roughness of the threads. Pacorito's ancestors could not have been more illustrious. His father, accused of having attempted to make his way into a house through the drain, went to Ceuta for a change of climate and died there. His mother, a great lady who for many years kept a chestnut stand in the Cava de San Miguel, had also fallen somehow into the hands of the authorities, and after much ado with judges and notaries, had repaired to the Alcala jail. Pacorito had one sister, but this last relative had deserted her post at the tobacco factory and flown to Sevilla in an amorous pursuit of an artillery officer. Up to the present, she has not returned. Migajas was therefore alone in the world, with no protection but that of God, and no guide but his own will. Part 2 the pious reader need not fancy that Pacorito was in the least daunted or disturbed at finding himself alone, not he. In his brief career he had had occasion to study the ways of the world, and he knew a thing or two about the fraud and vanity of life. He filled himself with energy and confronted the situation like a hero. He was on excellent terms with numerous persons of his age and quality, and even with bearded men who seemed disposed to protect him, so by dint of push he got the better of his sad condition. He sold matches, newspapers, and lottery tickets, three branches of industry which, if intelligently pursued, might certainly be productive of honest gain. And it so happened that Pacorito was never in want of a penny or so to assist a friend in need or to treat his acquaintances of the fair sex. He was spared all domestic worries, all household cares and exigencies. His palaces were the Prado in summer and the portals of the Casa Panaderia in winter. By nature he was frugal and wisely inimical to the pomps of the world. He slept anywhere ate whatever he found, just as the birds do, and suffered no anxiety on this score because of the religious submissiveness that filled his soul and his instinctive faith in that mysterious providence which deserts no one, great or small. One might be apt to conclude from this that Migahas was happy. It seems natural enough that he should be. He was deprived of relatives, it is true, but he enjoyed the precious boon of liberty— as his wants were few, the fruit of his labor kept him in plenty, and he was not indebted to anyone for anything. His sleep was disturbed neither by cares nor ambition. He was poor but contented. 
His body was destitute, but his spirit was rich in peace. Well, in spite of all this, my lord Pacorito was unhappy. Why? Because he was in love, over ears in love, as they commonly say. Yes, sir, this very Pacorito, who was so small, so ugly, so poor, and so alone, loved. Inexorable law of life, which permits no being, whatever his condition, to elude the despotic yoke of love. With a mind free from impure thoughts, our hero loved. He loved with a dreamer's idealism, yet at times he felt that ardent fire which sets the blood boiling like the very devil in his veins. The object of his thoughts aroused every variety of sensation in his volcanic heart. He had days of sweet platonicism like Petrarch, then again he was warm and impetuous like Romeo. And who, pray, had inspired Pacorito with this terrible passion? No less a person than a great lady who wore silk and velvet gowns, beautiful furs and gold eyeglasses, a great lady with flaxen ringlets that fell on her alabaster neck, and who had been known to sit at the piano for up to three days in succession. Part 3 Who was this celestial beauty, and how came Migahas to make her acquaintance? This is how it happened. Our hero's mercantile operations extended over a great part of one of the streets opening onto the Puerta del Sol, a busy thoroughfare lined with beautiful shops, the show windows of which are resplendent at night and display all the marvels of industry. One of these stores, which is kept by a German, is always full of exquisite trifles and novelties. It is the great bazaar of childhood, both juvenile and adult. During the carnival it is hung with grotesque masks. In Holy Week it is filled with figures of saints and pious images. At Christmas and New Year's it is all Bethlehem mangers and Christmas trees, laden with toys and magnificent presents. Pacorito's mad passion began when the German filled his show window with the most enchanting collection of richly dressed ladies that Parisian fancy could conceive. Almost all of them were two feet tall. Their faces were of highly refined wax, and the crimson of fresh roses could not equal the glow of their chaste cheeks. Their immobile eyes of blue glass shone with a splendor surpassing that of the human pupil. Their hair of softest crimped wool could with greater justice be compared to the rays of the sun than that of most great ladies, and the strawberries of April, the cherries of May, and the coral from the deep seas were ugly things compared to their lips. Their good breeding and deportment were such that they never stirred from the spot where they were placed. They merely creaked the wooden joints of their knees, their shoulders, and their elbows when the Germans sat them at the piano, or made them raise their eyeglasses to look out into the street. Otherwise, they were no trouble whatever, and no one had ever heard them say, This month is mine. There was one among them. What a woman! She was the tallest, the most lithe, the most beautiful, the most sympathetic, the most elegant, in a word, the greatest lady of them all. She was no doubt a person of high degree, judging from her grave, grand manner, and that patronizing air which was so becoming to her. Grand woman, she is the paragon, thought Pacorito the first time he saw her and for a whole hour he stood before the show window, rooted to the sidewalk. Part 4 Pacorito had reached the state of emotional excitement, the delirium peculiar to heroes of romance. His brain boiled, writhing, stinging serpents wound themselves around his heart. His mind was a volcano. He despised life. He longed for death. He soliloquized. He gazed at the moon. He soared beyond the seventh heaven. Many a time had night overtaken him in a melancholy ecstasy before the show window, oblivious to everything, oblivious to his very business interests. It might be well to state at once that our good Megahas met with no rebuff. I mean that his mad passion was, to a certain extent, reciprocated. Who can measure the intensity of a heart of tow and sawdust? The world is full of mysteries. Science is vain and will never penetrate the depths of things. 
Who will draw the line defining the exact sphere of the inanimate? Where does the inanimate begin? Down with the pedant who stands before a stone or a cork and says, Thou hast no soul. God alone knows the true dimensions of the invisible limbo, wherein rests all that which does not love. Pacorito was quite sure of having stirred his lady's pulse. She gazed at him, and, without moving a muscle, opening her mouth, or winking an eye, she spoke soulful things to him, now sweet as hope, now sad like the prescience of tragic events. This naturally fanned the flame that burned in our friend's heart, and his daring imagination conceived dramatic plans of conquest, and even of matrimony. One night, the faithful lover repaired punctually to the tryst. The lady was seated at the piano, her hands suspended over the keys, and her divine face turned to the street. The ragamuffin and she exchanged glances, and what passion, what idealism in that look. Sighs and tender thoughts were following one another when an event occurred which clipped the thread of this sweet communion and shattered at one blow the happiness of both lovers. It was one of those sudden catastrophes that inflict a mortal wound and lead to suicides, tragedies, and other lamentable things. A hand, proceeding from the interior of the shop, was thrust into the show window. It caught the lady by the belt and disappeared with her within. Pacorito's amazement was followed by a sense of misery so intense that he longed to die there and then. To see the object of his love vanish as though she had been swallowed by the insatiable grave, to be unable to rescue her or follow her, were it to the bottomless pit. Ah, here was a blow which was beyond human endurance. Megahas was about to drop on the sidewalk. He thought of suicide. He invoked God and the devil. They have sold her he muttered hoarsely, and he pulled his hair and scratched his face and kicked, and as he did so, he dropped his matches, his lottery tickets, and his newspapers. Worldly interests, you are not worth a sigh. Part 5 After a time, when he had recovered from his violent emotion, he glanced toward the interior of the store and saw two or three grown persons and several little girls talking with the German. One of these little girls held in her arms the lady of his thoughts. He felt like rushing upon them frantically, but he forbore, for it occurred to him that his appearance was not in his favor, and that there would be every chance of his getting a sound drubbing and being handed over to the police. He stood, rooted to the threshold, meditating upon the horrors of the slave trade, upon this heinous Tyrolese institution wherein a few dollars decided the fate of honest creatures, exposing them to the savage destructiveness of ill-bred children. Human nature appeared to him in all its baseness. Those who had purchased the lady left the shop and entered a luxurious carriage, and how they laughed, the wretches! Even the wee fellow, the most petted and spoiled of them all, no doubt, took the liberty of pulling the unfortunate doll by the arms, although he had the greatest quantity of toys appropriate to his age and for his own exclusive enjoyment. The grown persons, too, seemed satisfied with the new acquisition. While the footman stood by to receive orders, Pacorito, who was a person of heroic and daring resolutions, conceived the idea of swinging behind the carriage. This he did with that agility peculiar to the ragamuffin when he wishes to take a ride across the city. Stretching his neck to the right, he saw the arm of the lady who had been sacrificed to lucre sticking out of the window. This rigid arm in its pink fist spoke forcibly to his imagination, calling to him through the rumble of the wheels, Save me! Save me, my pacorito! Part 6 Under the archway of the great dwelling before which the carriage stopped, Pacorito's illusion vanished. A servant informed him that if he soiled the flagstones with his muddy feet, he would have his backbone broken. Megahas retired before this overwhelming argument, but from that instant his heart was filled with a scorching thirst for vengeance. His fiery nature impelled him forward into the night of the unforeseen, into the arms of his fortune. 
His soul was well fitted to noisy and dramatic adventures, so what should he do but make a compact with those who removed the garbage from the house where his beloved lived enslaved, and, by this means, which may not have been altogether poetical, but which revealed the shrewdness of a heart as big as the top of a pine tree, he found his way into the palace. How his heart throbbed as he went up the stairs and into the kitchen. The thought of being near her confused him, so that more than once his basket fell from his hand, spilling its contents down the steps. But nowhere could he see his lady love. He often heard the screams of children at play, but nothing more. The servants, because he was so little and so ugly, played many a trick upon him. One alone, who seemed more compassionate than the rest, gave him sweetmeats. One cold morning, the cook, through pity or through sheer wickedness, perhaps, gave him a draught of wine that was as biting and fiery as the very devil. The ragamuffin felt a warm and delightful current run through his whole body while hot vapors rose to his head. His legs trembled. His limp arms fell beside him in voluptuous abandon. A stream of playful laughter rose from his heart and gurgled from his lips, and Pacorito held onto the wall with both hands to keep from falling. A vigorous kick somewhat modified his mirth, and he left the kitchen. His brain was topsy-turvy. He had no idea where his steps were leading him. He ran along, staggering and laughing, first over cold tiles, then over smooth, boarded floors, then over soft, warm carpets. Suddenly, he caught sight of an object on the floor. He stood petrified for a second, then he uttered a roar of pain and fell upon his knees. Heavens! There, stretched before him like a corpse, with a crack through her alabaster brow, a broken arm, and disheveled locks, was the lady of his thoughts. For a moment our hero was speechless. His voice was smothered in his throat. He pressed the cold body to his heart and covered it with burning kisses. The lady's eyes were open, and she gazed with melancholy tenderness at her faithful lovers, for she lived in spite of her wounds. Pacorito knew it by the singular light of her calm blue eyes that emitted little flames of love and gratitude. Signora, let me know who reduced you to this sad condition, he exclaimed in pathetic and anguished tones. His pain was soon followed by a burst of rage, and he thought of the great revenge he would take upon the perpetrators of the iniquity. Just then he heard footsteps approaching, so he tucked the lady under his arm and started on a run. He went down the stairs, crossed the court, and broke into the street. He could scarcely be said to be running. He was flying, like a bird that has stolen grain, heard a report, and, feeling itself unhurt, determines to put the greatest possible distance between itself and the gun. He ran past one, two, three, ten streets, till he thought he was far enough away to be in safety, and then stopped to rest, laying the object of his insensate tenderness upon his knees. Part 7 Night came upon him, and he welcomed with delight the soft shadows that hid the daring act and protected his love. He examined her injured body carefully and concluded that the wounds were not serious, although one might have seen her brain, had she one, through the opening in her skull, and the sawdust of her heart poured out in copious streams through the rents in her breast. Her gown was in shreds, and part of her hair had been dropped in the hasty flight. His soul overflowed with sorrow when he realized that he had not the money with which to meet the situation. As he had given up his business, naturally his pockets were empty, and a loved woman, particularly if she is in poor health, is a source of unlimited expense. Megahas laid his hand sadly upon that part of his rags wherein he had habitually kept his coin, but nothing was there. At this critical moment, thought he, when I need a house, a bed, a world of doctors and surgeons, an abundance of food, a bright fire, and a dressmaker, I have nothing, nothing. But, as he was very tired, he lay his head upon his idol's body and fell asleep like an angel. Then a great miracle took place. The lady began to revive and, finally rising to her feet, showed Pacorito a smiling countenance. 
The wound had disappeared from her noble brow. Her lithe form was without a rent, her gown neat and whole. On her curled and perfumed locks, she wore a coquettish hat trimmed with minute flowers. In a word, she stood before him in all her beauty, just as he had known her in the show window. Migahas was dazzled, stupefied, dumb. He fell on his knees and worshipped her as people do a divinity. Then she took the ragamuffin by the hand, and in a voice clear, pure, and sweeter than the song of the nightingale, she said to him, Pacorito, follow me. I want to show you my gratitude and tell you of the sublime love with which you have inspired me. You have been loyal, constant, generous, heroic. You have rescued me from the power of those vandals that tortured me. You deserve my heart and my hand. Come, follow me. Do not be foolish. Do not think you are inferior to me because you are in rags. Megahas gazed at the lady's elegant, luxurious attire and said sadly, My lady, where can I go in this dress? The lady did not answer. She merely led Pacorito by the hand into a mysterious region of shadows. The ragamuffin soon found himself in a grand parlor, brilliantly illumined and filled with beautiful objects. The first moment of bewilderment passed, he distinguished a thousand different figures and statuettes like those that peopled the shop in which he had seen his beloved for the first time. What greatly surprised him was to see all the fine ladies who, in shimmering gowns, had occupied the show window with his friend come forth to meet them. His lady accepted their homage with grave and ceremonious courtesy. She seemed to belong to a higher caste than they. Her queenly manner, her proud, though not haughty, bearing suggested dominion. She immediately presented Pacorito. For his part, he was much confused and grew redder than a poppy when the princess, taking his hand, said, Allow me to present to you the Signor Don Pacorito de las Migajas, who will honor us with his presence tonight. The wings of his heart drooped, as they say, when he compared the luxury that surrounded him with his own poverty, his rags, his bare feet, his torn trousers upheld by a single suspender, and his coat sleeves cut off at the elbow. I can divine your thoughts, said the princess, aside. Your dress is not the most appropriate for a celebration like this. As a matter of fact, you are not presentable. Signora, that deuced tailor of mine, stammered Megahas, has been false to his word and... Never mind, we will dress you here, said the noble lady. The valets in this strange mansion were tiny and very comical monkeys. We parrots of the kind known as pericos added as pages to say nothing of a great number of paper birds. They immediately set to work to repair, as far as it was possible, Pacorito's unfortunate appearance. They slipped his feet into a pair of tiny, gilded matchboxes that made the most stylish boots. They cut a neckcloth for him out of half a little red paper lantern and turned an osier flower pot into a sort of pastoral hat which they trimmed elaborately with flowers. As Pacorito had never been decorated, they took a metal plate from an elegant kepi and hung it round his neck by way of a decoration, and also a matchbox which was round and looked like a watch and the cut glass stopper of a small bottle of perfumery. The paper birds conceived the happy thought of putting an ivory paper cutter in his belt to figure as a sword or dagger. Thanks to these and numerous other inventions for concealing his tatters, our friend looked so handsome that no one would have recognized him. As he caught sight of himself in the mirror top of a workbox, he swelled with pride. He was radiant. Part 8 The ball now began. A number of canaries from their respective cages sang waltzes and habaneras. The cornets and the clarionets, too, were very skillful in pressing their keys all by themselves. The violins pinched their own strings, and the trumpets blew into each other. 
Megahas thought this music was entrancing. It is unnecessary to say that the princess danced with him. The other ladies found partners among the officers of the army and the sovereigns who had left their horses outside. Among these were Prince Bismarck, the Emperor of Germany, and Napoleon. Megahas was beside himself with pride and excitement. It would be impossible to describe the emotions of his soul as he dashed into the dizzy whirls of the waltz with his beloved in his arms. Her soft breathing and an occasional stray lock of her golden hair caressed his cheek, tickling him gently and producing a strange intoxication. A loving glance or a little sigh of fatigue would every now and then put a climax to his madness. Suddenly, the monkeys appeared and announced supper. This caused a great commotion. Megahas rejoiced greatly, for, with no prejudice to the spiritual character of his love, the poor little fellow was very hungry. Part 9 The dining hall was superb and the table exquisite. The china was of the very finest manufactured for dolls, and a multitude of bouquets showed their colors and scattered their fragrance from egg stands and thimbles. Pacorito sat at the princess's right. They began to eat. The parrots and paper birds waited upon them with such order and rapidity that they seemed like soldiers drilling before their general. The dishes were delicious. Everything was raw, or at all events, cold. Megahas was rather pleased with the supper at first, but he was soon surfeited. The menu was as follows. Bits of sponge cake, turkeys smaller than birds, which one could swallow at a mouthful, gilt heads no bigger than almonds, a rich supply of hemp seed, a pâté of bird seed a la canaria, bread crumb a la perigona, a fricassee of pheasant's eyes with a sauce of wild mulberries, a salad of moss, delicious sweetmeats, and every possible variety of fruit harvested by the parrots from the tapestries where they were embroidered, the melons being as small as grapes, and the grapes as small as lentils. During the supper, the company chattered ceaselessly, all but Megahas, who, being short of wit, sat there and said never a word. He was confused in the presence of so many gold-corded and uniformed generals. He was amazed, too, at finding so much loquacity and frolicsomeness in these great men who had stood stiff and dumb in the show window as though they were made of clay. The one known as Bismarck, in particular, never stopped to draw breath. He said the wildest things imaginable, pounded the table with his fist, and threw bread balls at the princess. He flung his arms about most marvelously, just as though a string were attached to their hinges, and somebody under the table had hold of it. "'What fun I am having,' said the Chancellor. "'My dear Princess, when a man spends his life adorning a mantelpiece in the cheerful company of a clock, a bronze figure, and a pot of begonias, he really needs recreation, and at a festival like this he lays in a supply of mirth for the year.' Ah, happy, a thousand times happy, they whose only duty consists in adorning mantelpieces, said the lady in melancholy tones. It may be wearisome, but you do not at least suffer as we do, we whose lives are a prolonged martyrdom, we the toys of the small men. It would be impossible for me to make you understand, Prince Bismarck, what we suffer when one pulls our right arm, another our left, when this one cracks our head, that one quarters us or leaves us in the water to soak or rubs us open to find out what is inside of us. I can imagine it, said the Chancellor, opening his arms and clapping them together several times. How unfortunate, said Espartero and two of the emperors at once. I was the least unfortunate of all, said the lady, for I found a friend and protector in the valorous and faithful Megahas who managed to save me from the barbarous torture. Pacorito blushed to the very roots of his hair. Valorous and faithful, repeated all the dolls in admiring chorus. And therefore, tonight, 
when our genius creator permits us to come together for this great celebration, I chose to honor him by bringing him with me and offering him my hand as a sign of alliance and reconciliation between the lineage of dolls and that of well-bred, compassionate children. Part 10 at this, Prince Bismarck looked at Pacorito with an expression of such malignity and sarcasm that our illustrious hero was filled with wrath. At the same instant, this wretch of a chancellor aimed a bread ball at Megahas and fired it so accurately that the bridegroom came near to being blinded for life. But Megahas was a prototype of prudence and circumspection, so he controlled his feelings and was silent. The princess threw him a glance of love and gratitude. "'What fun I am having!' repeated the Chancellor, clapping his wooden hands together. "'Before it is time to resume our place beside the clock and listen to its unceasing tick-tack, let us fathom the depths of pleasure and intoxication. Let us be happy. If the Signor Pacorita would favor us by calling the daily paper, we might laugh a little.' "'The Signor de Megahas, said the Princess kindly, "'did not come here to make us laugh. But there is no reason why we should not enjoy hearing him call out the paper, or even matches, if he is willing to do so. The ragamuffin could find no words with which to answer his beloved. He was sorely incensed at the proposition, which he judged to be a fling at his dignity and decorum. Let him dance, shouted the Chancellor impertinently. Let him dance on the table and if he refused to do so, I move that he be stripped of the fine clothes we have dressed him in, and be left ragged and barefooted as he was when he came. Megahas felt all the blood rush to his heart. He was blind with rage. Do not be cruel, my dear prince, said the princess, smiling. Leave him to me. I will take it upon myself to dispel the storm that is rising within our good Megahas here. A loud peal of laughter greeted this reply, and all the dolls and the most celebrated generals and emperors of the world simultaneously fell to pounding one another's heads like the Punch and Judy puppets. Make him dance! Make him call matches! they clamored. Megahas felt faint. The sentiment of dignity was so powerfully developed in him that he would have died rather than gone through the suggested degradation. He was just about to reply when the malignant chancellor, pulling a long, thin straw from a work basket and wetting the end of it in his mouth, drove it into Pacorito's ear with such a quick movement that the latter did not realize the familiarity of the act until he had suffered the nervous shock produced by tricks of this sort. Blind with rage, he put his hand to his belt and drew the paper cutter. The ladies shrieked and the princes fainted, but the enraged Megahas, far from being pacified by this, seemed to be growing more and more infuriated, and, rushing upon his insolent adversary, he began to deal blows right and left. The air was filled with yells, threats, and imprecations. The parrots croaked and the very birds moved their paper tails in sign of panic. Nobody laughed now at the daring Megahas. A few moments later, the Chancellor might have been seen going about gathering up his arms and legs, a strange case which cannot be explained, and all the emperors were noseless. They gradually, however, with a little glue and a great deal of innate skill, mended one another. A rare advantage, this, of puppet surgery. The princess, having recovered from her swoon through the virtuous smelling salts administered by her pages in a filbert shell, called the ragamuffin aside, and, leading him to her private apartments, spoke as follows. Most illustrious Megahas, what you have just done, far from lessening my love for you, has only increased it. For you have given evidence of indomitable valor by your easy triumph over this swarm of scoffing puppets, the most despicable class of beings on earth. The tender sentiments that bind me to you move me to propose that you become my husband with no further delay. Pacorito fell on his knees. As soon as we are married, the empress and chancellors will all venerate you as they do me, for I must tell you that I am queen of this division of the world. 
My titles are not usurped. They are transmitted by the divine law of puppets, established by the supreme genius that created us and governs us. My lady, Megaha said, or tried to say, my happiness is so great that I cannot express it. Very well, then, said the lady with great majesty. Since you are willing to become my husband, and consequently prince and lord of this puppet kingdom, I must inform you that in order to do so you will have to renounce your human personality. I do not exactly grasp your majesty's meaning, said the ragamuffin. You belong to the human race. I do not. Our natures being different, we cannot unite. There is but one way. Give up your humanity. It is the easiest thing in the world, believe me. It is only necessary that you will it. Now answer me, Pacorito, son of man. Will you be a puppet? The peculiar nature of this request set the ragamuffin to thinking for a few seconds. And what does this thing of being a puppet consist in? You will be like me. Our nature is perhaps nearer perfection than yours. We are, to all appearances, devoid of life, but we live, believe me. To the imperfect senses of man we lack movement, words, affection, but this is far from being the case. You have had an opportunity of judging how we move, how we speak, and how we feel. Our fate, for the present at least, is not a very happy one. We are the toys of your children, and even your men, but as a compensation for this disadvantage, we are eternal. Eternal? Yes, we live forever. When these wicked children of yours break us, we rise with new life out of our destruction and are born anew, describing a mysterious and everlasting circle from the shop to the children, from them to the Tyrolese factory, and thence to the shop again, through the ages, everlasting. Through the ages everlasting, repeated Megathas, absorbed. It is not always rose color with us, but, on the other hand, you see, we do not know death, and then our genius creator permits us to meet at certain great festivals to celebrate the glory of our race, as we have done tonight. We cannot elude the laws of our being. It is not given to us to enter the reign of humanity, although men can easily enter ours, and in fact have very often been known to become puppets. A most extraordinary thing, exclaimed Pacorito, full of amazement. You know the requirements of puppet initiation. I have nothing more to say. Our dogmas are very simple. Now. Meditate upon it and answer my question. Will you be a doll? The princess's attitude was that of a priestess of antiquity. Pacorito was captivated. I want to be a doll, declared the ragamuffin resolutely. The princess then proceeded to trace diabolical characters in the air and to utter great words which Pacorito had never heard before and which were neither Latin, Chinese, nor Chaldean. He concluded that they were Tyrolese. When this was consummated, the lady threw her arms about Megahas, saying, Now you are my husband. I have the power of marrying and also of receiving neophytes into our great law. My darling little prince, may you be blessed through time everlasting. And the whole court of figures entered, singing, Through time everlasting, to the accompaniment of canaries and nightingales. Part 11 They all promenaded through the parlors in couples. Megahas gave his arm to his royal consort. What a pity, said she, that our hours of pleasure should be so brief. Soon we shall have to return to our places. His Serene Highness, Megahas, from the moment of his transformation, had begun to experience the queerest sensations. 
The strangest of these consisted in his having lost the sense of taste and the notion of food. All he had eaten lay within him as though his stomach had been a basket containing a thousand pasteboard viands which he did not digest, which had no substance, weight, taste, or nourishment. Moreover, he was no longer master of his movements, and was compelled to keep time when he walked, which was a difficult thing to do. He felt himself growing hard, as though he were being turned to bone, wood, or clay. He thumped himself, and behold, his body resounded like porcelain. His clothes, too, had grown hard, and were, in every respect, precisely like his body. When he found himself alone with his little wife and clasped her to his bosom, he experienced no human or divine sensation of pleasure, nothing but the harsh shock of two hard, cold bodies. He kissed her cheek. It was frozen. In vain did his hungry spirit call upon nature. Nature in him was what it is in a piece of pottery. He felt his heart throbbing like the machinery of a watch. His thoughts alone survived. The rest was all unfeeling matter. The princess seemed very happy. "'What is the matter, my love?' said she, observing Pacorito's expression of distress. "'I am weary, bored, bored to death, my dear,' said the lover, gaining assurance. "'You will get accustomed to it.' Oh, happy hours! If this lasted much longer, we could not endure it. Does your highness call this happiness? observed Megahas. What coldness! What emptiness! What rigidity! The aftertaste of human things still lingers in your soul, and you are still a slave to the views of your depraved human senses. Pacorito, I shall have to implore you to control these paroxysms, or you will be the demoralization and destruction of every living doll. Life! Life! Blood! Heat! shouted Megahas in despair, gesticulating like a maniac. What is happening to me? The princess clasped him to her bosom, and, kissing him with her red, waxen lips, exclaimed, You are mine forever! forever, through time everlasting. Just then they heard a great commotion and the sound of many voices crying, It is time! It is time! The clock struck twelve, and all had disappeared, princess, palace, dolls, and emperors. Pacorito was left alone. Part Twelve he was left alone in the most complete darkness. He tried to scream, but he was voiceless. He made frantic attempts to move, but he could not. He had turned to stone. He waited in anguish. Day dawned at last, and Pacorito had resumed his old appearance, but, strange to say, he was all of one color, and apparently all of one substance, his hands, his arms, his rags, his hair, and even the newspapers which he held in his hand. There is no doubt about it, said he. I have turned into a stone. Before him he saw a great sheet of plate glass with some letters on it running backward. Around him was a multitude of statuettes and fancy ornaments. Horror! I must be in the show window! A clerk took him carefully in his hands and, having dusted him, put him back in his place. His Serene Highness looked down upon the pedestal on which he stood and saw a card with the figures twelve dollars upon it. Good heavens! I am worth a treasure. That, at least, partially consoles me. And the people stopped on the other side of the plate glass to admire the wonderful bit of clay statuary representing a ragamuffin selling matches and newspapers. Everybody praised the artist and laughed at the droll expression and bungling figure of the great Megahas, while he, in the inmost recesses of his clay, repeated in anguish, A puppet! A puppet! Forever! Through time everlasting! So, that's really dark.
There are so many Christmas stories of toys that come to life, and we've had actually a lot of them on this channel. But this is our first story where a living person becomes a doll. And how terrible his transformation is, not only because it doesn't feel good physically, and he immediately longs for life and for heat, but he is also immediately bored, bored, the curse of eternal life, and he doesn't even have a moment of enjoying it. It's also a bit like Coraline, isn't it? I mean, yes, you can enjoy this and it'll last forever. You just need to do one small thing, but that thing is the most terrible thing. I've read this story several times now, and I also wonder if there isn't something of a social commentary in it. Galdos was profoundly anti-religious and socialist. He was interested in psychology and the Enlightenment, and for a man of his time and place, those thoughts would inevitably turn political. And I wonder if this story where he deeply romanticizes poverty, and he turns the emperors and poor Bismarck into cruel and soulless puppets, and makes vague statements about the great creator and eternal life, but maybe I'm reading too much into it. Benito Maria de las Dolores Perez Galdos is one of the great figures in Spanish literature. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize five times. He was incredibly well educated and he studied classic literature from throughout Europe, particularly being inspired by Dickens and Tolstoy, as well as, of course, Cervantes and other classic Spanish writers. He abandoned his law studies to hang out in the intellectual and literary circles of Madrid and transitioned from writing and publishing plays and stories to editing a literary magazine and expressing his opinions on a wide range of topics. In his time, he was most famous for a series of historical novels that he wrote from 1872 to his death in 1912. The Episodios Nacionales, I think, were a series of 46 novels covering the history of Spain from about 1805 to 1880. These novels were incredibly well researched, and Galdos spoke to survivors and to eyewitnesses, and he tried to really uncover the truth and present um, impartial evidence of these events while also telling a compelling story. These books were incredibly popular, and they not only formed the basis of his literary reputation, but they became part of how Spain saw itself during that period of history. Eventually, his opinions and his perspectives, along with his reputation and his education, put him into politics. It's a bit funny, he kept retiring, but he also kept getting back into it. In 1886, he was appointed as a representative for a municipality in Puerto Rico to the government in Madrid. He had never visited, let alone lived there, but he took it really seriously and tried to be a good representative. After five years, he stepped down. And a few years after that, he was elected as a representative again, this time for somewhere in Spain, and he stepped down again two years after that. And a few years after that, he was elected again as a deputy for Gran Canario, where he was born. By that time, he'd gone blind and he was experiencing financial difficulties, but he had supporters who put together various stipends and subscriptions and stuff for him. There was a national subscription to raise money for his Nobel Prize campaign, um, but they were not very successful and the efforts were abandoned during World War I. Check out his daily routine as a young man living in Madrid. He rose at sunrise. He wrote with a pencil until 10 a.m. Then he would go for a walk around Madrid, eavesdropping and observing people and trying to find material for his writing. In the afternoons, he would read classic literature in four or five different languages. In the evening, he would either attend a concert or he would go for another walk and he would go to bed early. There's something wonderfully monastic, but also kind of peaceful and studious and meditative about his routine. I love it. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that I'm trying a new mantra, and it is, I always do everything. Like many people, I struggle with procrastination, and it feels like every moment of every day I have a little nagging voice in the back of my head telling me what else or what more I ought to be doing. But the truth is, I always do everything. I never miss a deadline, everything is always taken care of, everything is fine. Yes, I'm not as proactive as I could be. Like, I keep the house tidy, but I don't really keep it clean. Things get dirty before I clean them. But then I do clean them when they get dirty. 
and I repair things and I improve things and I finish projects and I execute plans and I achieve goals. I always could do more and I always could do better, but I do always do everything. The thing about the stupid nagging voice is that it robs me of enjoying my accomplishments and enjoying my downtime, and I don't even enjoy my wasted time. If I'm going to waste time, I should embrace the waste and not beat myself up over it. I can trust myself to get it together and take care of business when necessary. I have a proven track record. So yes, I am reminding myself that I always do do everything, and it is fine. And being mean to myself doesn't help anything anyway. So perhaps a similar strategy might help you deal with your procrastination. Perhaps not. If you have any good tips, do let me know in the comments below. If you want to beat procrastination, click like and subscribe right now. Do not wait or the moment might be lost. Every week I find weird, old, obscure stories and I share them with you and you wouldn't want to miss anything. In the description below, you will also find a link to buy me a coffee, which would be a fantastic way to help me do everything. Thank you so much for your support and I will see you in a few days.